<laughs> I'll be back in September. <laughs> On the other hand, who needs a pool when you've got this? Due east is the ocean and the world-famous Great Barrier Reef. Now, I'm on Lizard Island and out there is the Great Barrier Reef, one of the great natural wonders of the world. It's a huge living organism that stretches for hundreds of miles up and down this coast. And it's the only living thing that can be seen from space. And when the Olympic torch comes to here, um, you know, on its way to Sydney, it's actually going to go under the water, over the reef. Now, how are they going to do that? How are they going to do that? No one tells me anything. No idea. Do you know how they're going to do that? Good night. <laughs> that was a real Australian male. <laughs> We've come here to the outer edge of the reef to meet a man who dreamed of spending his life diving here and made the dream come true. How is it amongst the fish? Mike Ball has expanded his diving hobby into a multi-million dollar business catering to thousands of underwater enthusiasts. Sun, sea and exotic creatures. Uh, this is Mike Ball, and we're in his office. <laughs> it's a pretty good office, isn't it? And that's Martin Clunes, and he's relaxing. I hope you see him in the, in the distance there. Mike, you came over from England. You started off in England, didn't you, and ended up out here? Yeah, yeah. I came down here in 1968. I was a ten-pan pom. Well, what age were you? Uh, 21. Straight out of the army or something like that? Yeah, Royal Marines. Straight out of the Royal Marines, turned up here. How did, how did you suddenly, you know, well, suddenly, over a 20-year period, make yourself 10 mil? Uh, well, I arrived in Sydney. I was delivering bread for the first six months. I bought this old 1957 Filman Minx. It cost me £50. So £10 bomb, this £50 bomb, headed to the Great Barrier Reef because that's what my love was, to go diving. And um, then I started working in a sports shop, selling diving gear, and then gradually expanded from there. So was there no kind of competition? I mean, there must have been another dive operation set up. No, no, so back in those early days, it was, you yeah, know, tourism was just not like it is now. I mean, the Great Barrier Reef is world famous and we get thousands of people coming here to dive with me, hopefully. Mm. Uh, but back then, there was just, um, you know, it was, there was no real tourism. Yeah. <laughs> what was that you telling me earlier on about your teachers, though? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I actually haven't had my school report with me. Yeah, yet. yeah, I know you have. Yeah, yeah. Completely so uncontrived that, uh, moment. <laughs> so I went to school at, um, in Christchurch in Dorset. And I was not really highly thought of in my sort of final years at school. Still in pristine condition. He's really been <laughs> proud of this book for, for 30 years, nearly. You know, As yeah, you can well, guess, I never, I never showed this to a, to a prospective employer uh, with comments like, this report represents a serious and inexplicable deterioration of attitude to work and school life generally. And my headmaster said, I have nothing to add to his foremaster's remarks. His attitude makes a mockery of external examinations. Names. Let's have names of these dwarfs. Names. Yeah. names. Yeah, these We've all suffered from these dwarfs who <laughs> taught us at school and complained we weren't more like that. And them. which Let's one of these teachers names. strapped you? Oh, the ones who whipped on. you, should mark I've them. got a Mr Hopewell in my background, told me <laughs> yeah, I'd Mr. make it as an actor. Mr Bentley, he was mine, he was Who's mine. Who's yours? Names. Uh, Bill Cotton. Bill Cotton. Oh, I ran the BBC, did quite well. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, sorry, sorry Bill. <laughs> in fact, the final testimonial from Mr. Cotton was always a difficult boy to understand, blessed with an all-round... Always, oh, yeah. <laughs> always a difficult boy to understand. Going, okay, mine was, he's a complete tosser, he'll amount to nothing. <laughs> but it, I don't think it said tosser. Mine said, just go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Heading inland, following the path of the Olympic flame, we swing through Cairns, another meeting place for backpackers. And now, the base for exploring the reef. Cairns City Council and City Library. A whiff of colonial to that. Definitely. A 
Oh, this doesn't seem right either. Oh, we're in that. We're back here. We're back in the markety place. Let's go around here and do another left. Where are we going now? I have no idea. I thought I might go around here again. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> That's quite a nice building. See, that does look old and colonial, doesn't it? But... Here's a, a local landmark, which is a giant Captain Cook. The biggest Captain Cook we've seen so far. Ever. With the strongest Nazi salute. <laughs> exactly. And I was wondering if that's where the sock thing came from over here, because... He's only got, got half trousers. He's only got half trousers. In the olden days, they favoured a half trouser. This is, must be it, I reckon, because they like their shorts and socks over here now. This must be a well, what they're doing is they're wearing a quarter trouser with a full sock. <laughs> Thus, they've left some area of vagary in the middle between the, the trouser end and the sock top. You've seen the coppers and the sock brigade. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're not afraid of uh, wearing shorts, <laughs> pulling the socks up to the knee with a nice neat fold over. A lot of the men, I mean, not just the coppers. No, it's yeah, kind of, a, sort of an Australian a... neat person's look. A man can have dignity in a long trouser and have knobbly knees, but in shorts, he's uh, sunk. There's no hope. I wouldn't even stop if he went like that. <laughs> Sorry, mate. You've got twiglets with socks on. <laughs> <laughs> well, he only had short socks, but he was itching them up there. <laughs> he wanted them as high as possible. They do, don't they? They the one just below the knee and pristine white. It's like the trousers on a Frenchman. <laughs> as they get older, they head higher and higher up to just, just above the nipple. <laughs> Leaving the region's fashion centre, we head to the northernmost tip of Australia, Thursday Island. Few people get up this far. Its culture has more in common with the South Sea Islands than with the mainland. City pressures are a long way away, and the further north you go, the more laid back it becomes. What's up? <laughs> You're the captain. More boats, more blue water, and stacks of luggage. And we're only here for a night. Most Thursday Islanders have ancestors who were warriors, and they originally got here by canoe from Papua New Guinea. Their history is full of tales of torture and cannibalism. This stretch of water struck fear into the hearts of the early explorers. It's hard to imagine today. This is a fascinating spot, Thursday Island. It's strategic both historically and um, geographically. It's right here on the Torres Strait here. And uh, everybody who came first came to Australia came through the Torres Strait. Captain Cook sailed through there. A few years later, um, Captain Bly, after the bounty had mutinied, when he was thrown out in his boat, came drifting through these islands. And um, he passed one of them on a Wednesday. So being of uh, an imaginative bent, he named it Wednesday Island. Um, and a few years later, when they came to name the other islands, equally imaginatively, they started, to, <laughs> this is Thursday Island, this Friday, Tuesday. They pegged out their territory um, here on Thursday Island as being a sort of outpost and to defend this access into Australia. Ted Mosby is a maverick bishop who has split from the mainstream Anglican church. A daily walkabout is central to his style of ministry. He opposes a, a friendly atmosphere, and I think people here think family. Like, when, when people make you friend, you're friend. You know, you, people come here as Europeans, they feel sometimes out. They're not part of the scene. I think people welcome them readily, and. They become part of the friendliness of the place. This uncle here comes from Boigu. Boigu's one of the islanders. Let's you must come in a shower. No, 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 you know the Great Barrier Reef? This is Martin. Uh, you know the Great Barrier Reef? Yeah. Well, Murray is the furthest east of our island, and our brother, he comes from Murray. 
Maori is like the end of Barrier Reef. Oh, right. That's where you turn straight in. Barrier. I see a change coming over the Aussie male, though. As the uh, lifestyle at home is changing, more responsibilities are given to men to, to be part of the caretaking at home. And to some who are still used to the old system, is it's hurting. Really? They, uh, they, their life is being torn because they're so used to this form of, of way being, being decision makers. But with lifestyle changing, women folks are, are, are doing the decision with Do you them. think that's a move for the good? I believe uh, our family is a family. Yeah, yeah. Little mama, tell me, tell me little mama. Little mama, little mama. <coughs> It's always the blokes. Very rude. To Ted, the essence of island life is its friendliness. Essential, perhaps, when there are so many other things out there that can get you. Besides the dogs, that is. Apart from the jellyfish, the stingray, the sharks, the dangerous currents, um, and the stonefish, uh, there's crocodiles here. Crocodiles? The waters are teeming with crocodiles. I wouldn't even put my toe in there. There's uh, been a few people taken by crocs. There's uh, one in the hospital right now. Really? I visited him, visited him uh, on Sunday, Sunday afternoon. He what? was a tourist uh, traveling up on, on kayaking canoes, and uh, he went down into the water with knee, knee uh, high, and the croc got him from the back. Did it take his leg? Well, it done a bit of damage to people. It didn't take it off, though. Bishop Ted knows his flock intimately. No one here is untouched by his spiritual care. Wafted from the South Pacific to a Harrogate tea dance. Strange. This is a roughhouse town in the middle of nowhere. Flies, dust, and heat that can melt the roads. But there's more to it than meets the eye, literally. The Mount Isa mine is one of Australia's richest, where men go way down under for 12 hot, dark hours at a time. Like other mining towns, Mount Isa is male-dominated. Men come here to work for months on end to make fast money for hard labor. Five years ago, a bloke was walking around the hills around here and he found a lump of lead. And now this mine is one of the biggest producers of lead, copper, zinc and silver in the world. Its deepest mine shaft goes down a mile and its chimney stack is as tall as the Eiffel Tower. Without the mine, there would be no town. Three and a half thousand men and some women are employed here seven days on, seven days off. All right, mate. Push up, boys. Yeah, if you push up, they want me to stand here. 